Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us uh, today. My name is Priya Abawal, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Paper. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with the company, Paper partners with K-12 schools throughout North America uh, with a mission to give every student an equal opportunity to excel academically. Uh, our educational support system provides learners with unlimited 24-7 homework help, writing feedback, and study support. Um, our uh, tutors deliver on-demand one-on-one academic support in four languages across more than 200 academic subjects. So students always have access to the expert help when, where, and how they need it. Uh, we're really, really excited to bring together and put together this for teachers by teachers discussion series, um, bringing educators from across the nation to share their insights and how you can take charge of your tech infused classrooms. Um, today's panel uh, is going to be sharing their firsthand experience in implementing different ed tech tools into their day to day instructional strategies. Uh, you'll hear of really creative ways to enhance your instructional strategies to meet the evolving needs of your students, especially in this current environment. Um, for this conversation, I'm excited to bring together Kristen Brownell joining us from Huntington Beach, California. Hi, Kristen. Jennifer Ingold joining us from Long Island, New York. Hi, Jennifer. Shannon Moore joining us from Visalia, California. Hi, Shannon. And Mark O'Reill joining us from Northville, Michigan. Hi, Mark. The discussion is going to be moderated by Matt Rhodes, a teacher, education specialist, lecturer, as well as an author. Uh, before I kick off to Mar uh, uh, hand over to Matt to kick off the discussion, just a few logistics for today. All attendees are in listen only mode, but we do highly encourage you to share your thoughts and your questions through the chat feature in the Zoom. Uh, please do join the conversation as we, as we have um, the event today. Um, and with that, without delay, uh, please welcome Matt and the panelists for today. Matt, over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate Paper for hosting such a uh, dynamic series that we're going to have. We have experts from around the country and tonight you're going to learn many different strategies that you can integrate with EdTech to amplify student learning. And this is just the first uh, panel of a series of three. And I can't wait to moderate not only this one, but one in, on March 11th. And then we'll have one later on this spring. All these topics tonight are highlighted in my upcoming book, Navigating the Toggle Term, a guide for K-12 classroom and school leaders. I'm super excited to talk about this. Uh, several of uh, our panels here are contributing authors and have their voice recognized in the book, talking about their experience over the last uh, eight to 12 months in education, really talking about how they integrate uh, technology into their instruction. And speaking about uh, instruction, that's really what tonight is about. And when it comes to teachers, teachers are what drive instruction and the tech tools are there to help enhance our instruction. The teacher is uh, pragmatically going to incorporate strategies and their tech to support students in their learning. And we're gonna talk about a number of different types of ed tech tools tonight. Um, we're gonna to be talking about uh, interactive slides, such as like Google Slides, enhanced with like Pear Deck or Mentimeter, Boneseed, Nearpod, et cetera. And we're gonna talk about several strategies of how teachers incorporate those into their instruction. Uh, we're going to talk about content creation tools from Google Workspace to um, Microsoft 365, as well as Adobe. Uh, so many different creative opportunities, not only for our teachers to create content for our students, but also for our students to create content. Something unimaginable, you know, 10 to 15 years ago in education. So we've come a long ways there. We're going to talk about um, how our virtual class settings conducted on uh, Zoom. Google Meet, Microsoft um, Teams, and really gonna dive deep into what are some good best practice strategies with those. 
And then we'll talk about, in addition, uh, some academic support tools, um, including uh, paper tutoring um, as one that can really enhance our students' learning experience, whether they are all the way online in a blended setting or in a traditional classroom setting. So we have about five questions tonight, but first I'm going to uh, allow each of the panelists to introduce themselves and give, um, uh, give us their context and education and a little bit about their background and experience. So let's start off with uh, Jennifer and we'll go with Shannon, then we'll go with uh, Kristen and then we'll end with Mark. So uh, kick us off, uh, Jennifer, go ahead. You're muted. Sorry about that. I was actually checking something that I was going to share. Um, uh, we're not doing question two yet, right? No, we're talking about your context. Give us some background about yourself and your uh, where are you currently teaching? Are you online or you're uh, in a blended learning situation? Uh, so just give us that context and some of your experience because we're introducing everyone right now. Okay, um, well, I'm Jennifer Ingold. I teach eighth grade social studies in Bay Shore, Bay Shore Middle School on Long Island in New York. I am 100% fully virtual. I'm one of 15 teachers in my building that's 100% virtual. I'm the only eighth grade social studies teacher that's virtual. Um, so I, my, my mantra this year has been I'm a, a virtual teacher living in a hybrid world, at least for another few weeks. Um, so it's it's been an interesting year. It's been quite a challenge. I've had to rethink and reimagine all of my school lessons, look at them through a completely virtual lens, um, think about what I do in the classroom or what I've done most of my career that's uh, successful, that really works with kids, think about some of my favorite activities, my, fam my favorite lessons. And um, the challenge has been, how do I take these things and you know, create virtual experiences. Really, that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to create or, or recreate, you know, the actual educational experience in a virtual world. And at the same time, create those um, really personal relationships that we know are so important to what we do. So, um, you know, when I sat in August and thought to myself, okay, well, how am I gonna do this? How am I going to create authentic organic relationships from scratch in a virtual world while, you know, drawing the kids in, um, like how I would usually do if I had them face to face, it really, my, you know, again, I think I've had to be reminded by my principal, my parents, and just about everybody I work with how much I love a challenge, but um, I have embraced this 110%. And um, I really think that I found a lot of success with the things that I've created and I'm still learning. And I think that's the best part about this is that I feel like this has been an opportunity for me to continue to mold my craft, for me to continue to learn and um, to really give kids an opportunity to learn in ways that they probably six, eight, 12 months ago would never have imagined would be possible. And so I'm excited to be here tonight to share some of my success stories with you in hopes that I can help others out there to do the same with their students. That's really, really awesome. I'm gonna piggyback on that. My name is Shannon Moore. I live in Visalia, California. I am a high school English and speech teacher, uh, as well as a site technology coach. Uh, I'm also a Google trainer, uh, a newly minted Adobe education leader, which I'm very proud of. Um, and we are currently completely virtual uh, with the conversation of potentially going hybrid if our county can get into the perfect tier for that. So uh, excited to be here, eager to share some of the uh, best practices I've integrated in my classroom this year. Um, and before I pass it off to my colleagues here, I would be so interested to know uh, where everybody is from and what you guys are teaching. So if you guys wanna pop it in the chat, um, just so we can kind of tailor suit some of our perspectives to your needs. So. Great to be here, excited for what's uh, gonna happen tonight, thanks. Hi guys, my name is Chrissy and I teach in Huntington Beach in Orange County, California. Um, I have been teaching for 14 years and I've actually been at the same school site for 14 years. Um, I'm pretty involved on campus in pre-pandemic, not global uh, virus times. I've been both the head chair coach and advisor for more than a decade. So I pretty much live on campus. 
Um, we have been fully um, fully virtual first semester. We've gone hybrid this semester. Um, I've been teaching from home with four small children at home too. Two that are school aged in TK and first grade. So I've sort of seen the gamut of online education, um, high school for me and my students, and then the little tiny ones with my kids, and then even like online preschool with my even younger ones. So it's been quite the adventure this year, but um, I've really sort of hit my stride with ed tech. I've always really enjoyed it, but um, it's just been a bigger challenge this year. My husband, way cooler than me, he's a video game designer. So technology has always been really integrated into our house with our kids. And, you know, if there's a new phone, we must own it. Um, so this has been um, a challenge and an adventure that I've sort of hit the ground running and enjoyed. And I'm looking forward to sort of sharing out anything that we've learned tonight. So thanks. And here we go. Hey, everyone. I am Mark Ureal. Um, I am currently teaching uh, at Hillside Middle School in Northville, Michigan. Um, this past year, I've really been navigating the toggle term. And the reason why I mean that is I just started teaching in my current job a month ago. Uh, over the past year at my old job, I was both hybrid and virtual at the same time, and then did live streaming, and then did virtual, and then back to live streaming. And now I am virtual and uh, in person at my new job. Uh, learning all sorts of different programs. I mean, I was a Google person and now I'm a Schoology and a Zoom person. Um, so I've been uh, learning just like everybody else, learning new programs and trying my best to uh, become an expert at them. And exciting to share uh, what I've been using in my classroom. Awesome, thank you so much panel for introducing yourself. We have such a diverse set here of educators across uh, the United States have been doing such amazing things. Um, as for myself, I've been, uh, I'm in San Diego County, uh, teach at the high school level as well as at the university level. So I get to see the higher ed perspective as well as uh, the K-12 perspective as well. And it's been a learning experience for me as well, just integrating all these tools and strategies to really try and make uh, learning engaging, collaborative, as well as uh, you know, fulfilling for our students during this time, given that it's a very tumultuous time. So tonight, uh, our questions, like I said earlier, are gonna be talking about enhancing instructional strategies with ed tech. And we have about five questions, six questions to go. And we're gonna start off with our first question, which is on interactive slides. So what type of strategies uh, do you incorporate with interactive slides to engage your students and amplify learning? Go ahead, Mark. All right, so for many years, I used to always teach with PowerPoint and PowerPoint's great, gives students a visual, but the students are more like passive learners than active learners. And so once I found about Pear Deck, it was an amazing tool. It allowed students to be more active in their learning. Uh, what I like to do with it, with my virtual classes, is I just like to put a link to the Pear Deck uh, right in the chat box. Uh, because if you have to share the screen, then you're using up all your school's bandwidth and then, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that. Um, you know, call, uh, classes get dropped, students get dropped, and, you know, you might not be heard by your students. Um, what I love about Pear Deck is the whole cognitive engagement. Um, usually in your class, you're in front of the class, you ask a class a uh, question, you might only get like a few hands. Well, with Pear Deck, you can ask a question and all of a sudden, instead of maybe like five kids answering, you get about 20, 25. And, and then what I do is I look at the responses and then I choose some good ones and I say, hey, who wrote this? And then all of a sudden you get your students participating. Um, other things I use for is good news. Um, I always start my class off with good news and Pear Deck, I always type in, hey, who's got good news? And then students share and then I choose some of the great ones. And then all of a sudden you get to learn about students' lives. Um, a lot of people use Pear Deck for the, the formative assessment. And what I mean by that is while you're teaching using your um, slideshow, you just stop, you ask a question just to see where the students are at. And if the students are understanding it, then you move on. But if they're not and all the students are answering incorrectly, then you know you need to reteach that concept. Um, my wife, she actually uses it. She's a math teacher and she loves it because, uh, for um, with math problems, uh, the drawing feature. Uh, which, you know, she gets to see the students actually show their work, which is huge in math, apparently. So, um, but yeah, Pear Deck, awesome tool, uh, gets students to be active learners and not just passive ones. 
Definitely. And that's just one example of an interactive slide. I mean, there are many different types of tools like Mentimeter, Bouncy, Nearpod, as people have been discussing in the chat tonight. Um, I use, for example, for my asynchronous uh, modules, I use Nearpod and I use preset lessons for my students to front load content. Uh, so if it's an asynchronous time, then students go on to a Nearpod and they complete a module that way. Or they also, in addition, they have a uh, basically a video that stops throughout to uh, check for student understanding. That's one uh, way I use interactive slides. Another one is I use Pear Deck um, app smashed with Flipgrid, which means that we have an SEL um, mood chart and essentially students get to circle or do a draggable on the word or feeling that they are um, feeling at that moment of time. And then there's a link directly to Flipgrid where students get to articulate uh, you know, their thoughts and feelings in addition so that I can get to know them and build a relationship for them in a, in a virtual setting because I don't get to see them every day in person. So that's just one of the major uh, integrations that I use with Pear Deck and Flipgrid. And what's great about interactive slides is you can use them as hubs to, um, like I said, App Smash or Hyperlink, various other tools to incorporate um, what I call multimodal learning where students get to uh, listen, speak, draw, create, etc. So that's one way that I really truly do like to use interactive slides. Uh, yeah, VR definitely uh, for that Nearpod, as well as Pear Deck has a hyperlink where you can insert like a Google map or an environment from Google Earth, which is huge. So speaking of um, like VR and creating content, I want to move on to our next question about content creation. So uh, it is, how do you use content creation tools to build your own digital lessons? We'll start with Jennifer, followed up with Shannon. I'm excited to hear about this. Muted. Jennifer, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. I'm more of a Google person than I am a Zoom person. <laughs> Google Meets, that's my, my school's platform. I was just saying that I decided to share the progressive era lesson. I had a couple choices, but I know whenever we've chatted, that one seems to come up in conversation. So I'm going to share a, meet, a link right now in the chat for everybody. If they want to click on that link, I, I believe it should work. If it doesn't work, let me know. I can go back and share it again. Matt, maybe you want to try to see if it works. Yeah, it works. It does? OK. So interestingly enough, I see I have a lot of Nearpod folks here. Um, I actually tried both Nearpod and Pear Deck. I've just found myself my own personal preference. Pear Deck seems to be, um, I like the social emotional component and the interactive slides on Pear Deck. So that was what first attracted me to that. Um, but as you can see, if you go through, this was my, um, this is actually a basic lesson structure that I developed using Pear Deck and also interactive hyperslides. Um, and as you go through, you could see that I have uh, an introduction slide. And then the next slide is an interactive poll that is actually a Pear Deck slide. And it incorporates, you know, content, um, talking about progressive era politics, giving students choices and these slides are super great for generating conversation. I do something with social studies called historical hypotheses. Who says hypotheses just have to be for science? They're great for social studies. Great conversation starters where you give students opportunities to you know, do a poll. You see which um, category comes out on top. So you know, in essence, they're making a prediction as a class, but you can give individual students the opportunity to talk about you know who wants to speak on behalf of the majority in the class who chose this, who'd like to talk about what they chose. If you go down to the next slide, um, we all know about fake news. That seems to be a big uh, term today in our, you know, in our modern world. So I go down and I ask them, you know, I put a quote in there, is this fact or is this fake news? So again, more conversation starters, generating more historical hypotheses. 
Um, and then what happens after that is I, I actually took my agenda slide out, but my agenda slide out says, you know, I still wonder. So then I introduce my lesson, my topic, and um, basically I put it out there that I still wonder where we're gonna wind up. Now we need to collect evidence to see if we're proving the class hypothesis that we generated from the previous two interactive slides, or if the evidence takes us in another direction. So you continue to go down, introduces the idea of Thomas Nast with an interactive video. So then I play the video and the kids continue to acquire some additional background information. Um, add some additional content with that. And again, you can see the background. Again, we're talking about progressive era and the news. So I made you know, the background, the New York Post, um, which is great. You know, Hyperslides are great for being able to change layouts and make um, you know, master slides. So every time you go and you're creating something, um, you're able to just kind of work off your master slides if you choose to, or you could go in another direction. So as I continue, um, you know, I share every day with my students what the goal of the lesson is or the unit. And this probably is one of my absolute favorite slides if you're following along. If you're not, um, I just put it in the chat. Slide number seven is a visual virtual map. It's a, actually a map to the class that basically shares with the kids. Okay, this is our learning target for today. These are our learning behaviors, key questions, and important keywords and terms. And I think that that's you know, great to just build up anticipation of where we're going. You know, it gives uh, students an idea of what to expect and putting everything on one slide I think is really great. I've also, every day I build in a uh, today's tech tip with them. It's usually a fun reminder on how they can use some sort of ed tech uh, device um, application or something that I'm doing with them in class. As you continue down, slide eight goes into just basic directions, something very similar to what you would do if you were face-to-face -face in a regular classroom. For this particular exercise, I decided to break the class into three different groups. Breakout rooms is super for this. Um, after you've given everyone their research assignments, they can go into breakout rooms and they can discuss uh, what they're gonna do next. And the last three slides are actually research slides that go with the Jamboard that I'm about to share with you. So in social studies, we do something, uh, we evaluate documents. And so um, what do I did- Do you wanna talk with, about that when you, we talk about uh, when you're in the next question? Yeah, actually, you know what, that, Matt, that's a great idea. I'm gonna stick this in there and then folks can go back to it when I talk about the next question. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Shannon, go ahead and tell us how you do uh, use some content creation tools to create these digital uh, lessons. Yeah, you know, so I think a lot of the time we don't or we take for granted the reality of what we have with an LMS. And I know we're going to get into details later on about how it's being used. Um, but for me, it's it's largely uh, kind of my platform. That's the first kind of uh, go-to that I go when I'm thinking about content creation. You know, what 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 is integrating appropriately with my LMS? I think that's my first consideration. And so, uh, fortunately, you know, uh, Jennifer gave us an insight about Pear Deck, and we use Pear Deck as well. It's one of my favorite content creation tools. But since she chatted about that, I do want to share about um, Adobe Spark. You know, a lot of us have really had to shift into this idea of video creation, it's like super, you know, uh, relevant, especially if you're in virtual or even in a hybrid setting um, or face to face, but uh, flipped classroom has always proven really beneficial. And so creating videos for your students, um, you know, is, is, is much more necessary. And so uh, for me, I use Adobe Spark a lot of the time for that, because the cool thing about Spark is not only can you create videos in that platform. You can also create flyers, uh, posters. You can also create web pages pretty seamlessly. And the great thing about Adobe Spark as well is uh, first and foremost, Adobe Spark is free for all K through 12 educators. And so, you know, if your, your students wanna get on and also be content creators um, and you wanna invite them into that process, you know, it's easy and accessible to them as well. Uh, I'll put an example there that you can take a look at uh, when you get a chance, uh, go ahead and open it up add it to your wakelet, whatever you would like to do to hold on and look at that later. Uh, additionally, I think that we uh, need to briefly talk, you know, Jennifer mentioned Jamboard. Uh, I am big on collaboration and I mentioned we were all virtual, right? And so that idea is, uh, of being virtual is you need to have a space where kids can collaborate because we know collaboration is best practice. And so 
um, in an effort to be uh, logical in our progression of the lesson and organized. I think it's uh, whiteboard.chat is a great resource uh, aside from Jamboard to be able to put the materials up. You can link videos into it. It's almost like it's its own slide deck in a way um, that then can support the lesson throughout and your students can move with you. You can keep them on pace with you or you can let them go free. So it can be used asynchronously or synchronously. Um, and then obviously when I'm thinking about discussion in the English classroom, I, I rely quite a bit on Padlet. Padlet is a great space for me as well. And so Padlet allows you to, you know, set it up in a variety of different ways. Um, at the end of the day, the most important piece is uh, this idea of uh, really offering opportunities for creativity. And so how do you do that? Well, you integrate all of those tech tools that have fantastic creative features um, because, you know, catching the eye and making it visually appealing is just as important as, you know, the content itself, in my opinion, so. Yeah, certainly. There's so many ways to make uh, really engaging content with students. There's really uh, no wrong way that you can go. There's just so many different strategies you can use. Uh, I think that uh, using Adobe Spark or um, just using just you know Google Workspace or and uh, Microsoft 365 Bitmoji. There's just so many different ways to go with this. So. Speaking of, uh, you know, creating, you know, more of this engaging content, um, Kristen, how are you doing that in your classroom? Hi guys. So um, in creating, I'm going to put two, um, two resources in the chat. Um, I always start, and this sounds really silly because a lot of students pretend like they don't care, but I always start with making stuff looking, look highly engaging. I use Bitmojis, I mean, more than a human being should. And I teach high school and at the beginning of the year, the kids were like, oh, that's so lame. And um, I presented some slides recently that were Bitmoji less because they were older and I just hadn't really updated them. And I got message after message where kids were like, you okay? Like what, what's, are you okay? What's going on? Just because the slides didn't look like they normally do. Um, so two places that you guys can find free kind of pre-made resources that just look pretty and look highly engaging before you even jump into anything is both Canva, um, which Canva is sort of like, I mean, it sounds like Canvas, you know, like it's sort of um, pre-made stuff. You can put your own stuff in, slides go, is a really great resource of just kind of cute looking slides that then you can, you know, build it on there. And I think that really does make a big difference. Um, I see Shannon adding ThingLink. ThingLink is a really, really, um, a really great resource, a really great website, also free um, to uh, collaborate for kids to work on um, uh, assignments together. Um, another uh, couple resources that I use, sorry, I'm trying to go fast. Another couple resources that I really like to use besides ThingLink um, and uh, you had mentioned Jamboard is uh, Padlet and Flipgrid. Um, those are two other really great places. And what I've used Padlet for this year that has been really successful um, is I teach English. So one thing that was really highly lacking was giving presentations and working on your listening skills to listening to a presentation. And um, so I have been using Padlet for that reason where I had kids record themselves giving a presentation. Um, I had them use Loom, um, L-O-O-M, I'll put it in there, but I had them use Loom, which is also free um, just to sign up with you know, an, an email address, but a lot of schools, um, it's part of like the package, a lot of schools have access to it also. Um, that way they can show their slides while they also speak. I'm sure you've seen those videos before where you're like a little bubble in the corner. You can change the size of the bubble. Um, they can also do it without their face, so it's just their yeah. voice. So I've had them record um, presentations, put them up on Padlet, and then I've actually given class time where I'm like, okay, you have class time, you need to go back and watch at least two of your classmates' videos and give them fill in the blank. Um, constructive criticism, tell them one thing you liked, um, you know, make a comment on their slides. Um, that's been really good. And I actually did that with freshmen and sophomores several times. And I always joked that it was a way to get them to um, interact, 
just virtually. Um, so those are some really, really good resources that I've used to get the kids kind of to empower them to discuss and collaborate and like be real human beings instead of just floating black boxes on a screen with their name. Yeah. So that's been, that's been really, really great. So I think Shannon's going to take over from here. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. That's um, something that is, you know, really important to take note is that creating these engaging spaces for students, you know, whether we are in person or online or in a blended situation is that it's different. We're not going to have as much interactivity as we would in person, but we can create these creative digital spaces with this content. So Shannon, um, do you want to add, add anything to this? Yeah, you know, I think also uh, I would, if we're talking about engagement, I think, uh, you know, we talked about this at the beginning, tools are, your tech is the tool, right? Um, and I think that when we are planning, we need to consider like, what uh, what platforms, products, our curriculum content, what what is high interest, right? We have a lot of students right now who are, um, you know, are engaging in a lot of passive learning, right? They, they sit on the other side of the screen and they say, give it to me. And so I think one way that we can kind of combat that is to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, interest matters. We care about it, it motivates us as adults. And so why wouldn't it as children? And so I try to include elements that really do capture their interest. One piece that I uh, am using recently is this uh, website and I might pronounce it wrong. It's either Blook It or Blook It, I don't know, but it's like a Kahoot or a quizzes. I just popped the link in the chat and it adds a competitive element like that is a lot of fun to, um, you know, to the kind of competition. And uh, I think at, your kids will love it as well. I think it's, uh, it, it's versatile across the uh, different grade levels. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is for us to give students uh, the opportunity for choice. You know, choice is super important when it comes to engagement. We have to encourage buy-in and ownership. Um, and so I, you know, I, I would recommend choice boards. Um, one last piece I'll discuss is this idea of, uh, you know, if we want to engage our kids, we need to shift our mindsets, in my opinion, from like it being a consum them consuming to them creating, right? Consumption over creation. I'm sure you've heard that all over education uh, this year and, and every year prior. And I think a lot of teachers are linking are latching on to that. And so use the Adobe Sparks, use the Google Drawings, use the Canvas. You know, um, a, a good friend of mine always gives me, you know, grief because she's like, you prepare too much. Let the kids do the inquiry, let them do the investigation, let them create um, and just give them those basic structures. And so, you know, a basic choice board where they then could go and dive in is simple. It's easy. You can make it on a slide. You can make it on a, a Google Doc. And here's the tip. And then I'll leave it at this and we'll, we'll transition. But here's the tip. Don't recreate the wheel, right? Like there are so many educators out there in the world. In fact, if you go onto Twitter, if you're a Twitter user, gotta love edu Twitter and do hashtag choice board, you will be amazed at the amount of choice boards that are on Twitter or Wakelet. Venture to Wakelet and search in exactly what you're looking for. And I tell you what, you're gonna find materials that teachers have you know, um, given for free. You can use it. They, they want to share because hashtag sharing is caring, so. No, definitely. I think that sharing and learning is, is essential here. And so many uh, resources are being popped into the chat, which is great. And after this is over, this recording will be on uh, the paper blog included with links from tonight. So for those that want to check out those later, they'll definitely be housed there. So let's transition to now just these virtual meeting spaces. So um, I want to ask uh, Jennifer, followed up with uh, Kristen, how do you use Go uh, Zoom, Google Meet, or Teams in your virtual classes? What are some best practice strategies that you use for your students? Well, ironically enough, I talked about a few of them. I, I, I shared before, I feel like all these things are really intertwined. I've been listening to that whenever anybody's talked, whether it's been Mark or Shannon or Kristen, you know, it, it's really amazing how as we go through each question, everything really sort of interconnects. I think that's the great thing about technology is just the interconnectedness of it. I've popped, as I was listening to people speak, I've popped a few things into the chat um, of great tools that I've used in different ways. 
Google Meet um, is my school's platform. And uh, we have, you know, we, there are a number of different things you can do with it. You can do polls, which are great. I do Pear Deck polls. I also do Google Meet polls. Google Meet, I love the whiteboard feature of Google Meet, which is very similar to a Jamboard. Those things could be sort of interchangeable. I'm going to pop my Jamboard activity back into the chat again. I know that it was shared prior. But if you take a look at that, um, the thing that's great is you can, again, have students create and share content in real time. You can have real time conversations. You can build on conversations. As the teacher, it's like, you know, whether you're using a Google Meet whiteboard or a Jamboard, you can actually draw the same way you would if you were face to face and have students do the same thing. You can share, you can share with the students, you can have them draw, you can have them create, you can have, uh, you, but you could basically delegate. You know, you could sit back and delegate and have them do the talking and them do the sharing. And um, along with that, the flip snack tool that I shared earlier that I put in the chat, um, which is a great tool. Most people have never heard of flip snack. One of the things that's great for generating conversations, whether you're over a Google Meet and you're trying to get kids to do a panel discussion and talk, if you're trying to get them to use a whiteboard or a Jamboard or whatever, you need to give them the tools so that they can feel like they can contribute. You know, one of the one of the biggest things I hear from teachers that's a struggle is they can't get their students to turn their camera on, they can't get their students to talk. So if you want to get that engagement going, it doesn't matter what platform you're on, Zoom, uh, Google Meets, you know, the biggest thing is the camera, right? We have to all be connected. So in order for you to get connected, you have to get engaged. And um, I put, uh, I created actually a book using Flip Snack. I created a tool for parents that was a book that parents have been using to help their kids at home. And then I created a book that kids can use that has all the tools necessary for them to participate in class discussions. And I put everything on my website, which is on Weebly. So again, when you think about how all these tools, one builds upon another and all the different things you can use with them, um, I think it's amazing what you can accomplish and what you can recreate in the virtual world um, that's very, very similar to what we enjoy face-to-face. -face if you, you know, find what works for you, your own personal toolkit, and then you share that with the kids, creating one big virtual community. So it's pretty oh. good stuff. For sure, it's all about community building relationships. And if we can use the right strategies and tools to do that, then we can be successful in any space. So Kristen, go ahead. Tell us a little bit how you use uh, these tools these for virtual class sessions. So I um, am a cheerleader at heart and I am the same in front of my classes as I am on the field and I am peppy and up to shenanigans all the time. And so I try to really get that to come across in my classes. So I'm gonna throw in the chat what I have up when students come into the class every single day. And when you first open it, it's gonna look very similar, or very simple, simple. It's gonna look very simple. It literally says class is gonna start in this amount of time. You know, I give them a couple minutes, heads up, run to the bathroom, get a drink of water. Um, it has today's date and it has the agenda for the day. And in my agenda, I actually link all of my slides for the day. So that way it makes it easier for me. Everything's in one space and I can just click things open because my classes are every other. So I have to have like a million tabs open. Um, I also have a would you rather. And it is sometimes like, would you rather swim in a pool of M&Ms or what, you know, sometimes it's total silliness. And sometimes it's like the one I have up here. Would you rather live in 24 hour daylight, 24 hour darkness? And then I say to the kids, they put it in the chat as they come in. It's just like darkness. And then I say, okay, now tell me, where is this in the world? You have three minutes. Everybody go learn as much as you can about daylight and darkness, 24 hours, go. And then while they're, while they're doing that, I play music and I usually play like NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, the kind of stuff I listened to in high school, which is horribly offensive when they say like, oh, throwback music, Blah. but, but when they come back, that's when the discussion starts. And I'm like, okay, tell me about it. And then they tell me place, you know, places where it's 24 hour darkness. And that's where the conversation starts. Does it have anything to do with English? Not a thing. But I just got the kids to go and research something. I got them to talk about it. And then they, they will straight up argue like, bro, what's wrong with you? Swimming in a pool of M&Ms is way better than a field of licorice. Like, then they start the conversation. And so I use that every day. I play music every day as they come in. I sort of try to set it up as like a community. 
Um, on Mondays, I start every class with Mad Lib Mondays. Most of my kids had never played Mad Libs before. So I start with Mad Libs Monday. I bought like an elementary school Mad Libs thing and then I go from there. And so that sort of gets the class going. Um, so I just put in my bit.ly for my um, virtual class for this year. And um, on Mondays, I do Magnificent Mondays. And I would say most of my kids turn on their cameras on Mondays um, because we have a theme every Monday, wear a hat, come to class wrapped in a blanket, bring your pet. I will tell you, high school kids love bringing their pet. I know elementary school kids love it, but high, schools lo high school kids love it too. Um, I had bring a stuffed animal to class and like, like so many 16 year old boys were like sitting there with like a teddy bear. So I think remembering that like, yes, it's school and yes, it's educational, but this is a crazy year. And so sort of creating that community in your classroom, I think is really important. And, you know, I start that with just a simple slide um, presented every day and um, kind of go from there. And then, you know, Zoom tools, like I'm always monitoring the chat. Um, Zoom has polls, which is really cool. Um, sometimes with my would you rather, I'll do like a Zoom poll and the kids can see it live to see what, you know, everybody else in their class thinks if they'd rather live in daylight or darkness or whatever. And the Bitmoji, I'm telling you guys, the Bitmoji goes a long way. No, for sure. That there's so many great ways, you know, during that synchronous live session, um, you know, to make that Zoom session or Google Meet session, like engaging to make students active in their learning. And that's essential, regardless of whether we're virtual or in person, a lot of the same things we can do in those settings. And there's a great question that was posed by um, the audience asking about being overwhelmed by tech tools. And I think that all of our panelists can agree is I think the idea of the philosophy is think less is more. I think having three to five really strong tools that you are good at, and then about three to five strategies to go with it, that's enough to be really successful. You don't want to go overboard with the number of tools that you have. That's going to not make you necessarily an expert at them and, and an expert at integrating the strategies. Rather, keep it simple. And then over time, feel free to explore and then expand your routines as the year goes take that risk and take that step, but go slowly and be judicious in selecting those tools. It doesn't need to be something that is like, you don't need to be the most creative person to create the most dazzling slideshow that's engaging, right? It all matters about, are you gonna use a good strategy with it? Like for example, on slides, uh, just simple strategy like think, pair, share that can be utilized in a virtual meeting session as well as uh, in person about just switching the slides strategically, allowing your students to collaborate on a single slide or a discussion board. There's just many integrations that you can use with one tool. So I hope that um, when you're thinking about using tools, it's not about uh, the number that you're using, it's about the number that you feel comfortable with and that you know how to integrate the strategies with. And with that, I wanna move on to our next question is, just the notion of engaging students with a particular set of tools. I talked just for a moment about Think, Pair, Share, which is like a really well-known strategy that you can integrate uh, with interactive slides. And I know that Mark has been in so many different settings this year that I would like him to talk about um, how does he engage students in these routines with a particular set of tools while navigating whether you're in a you know, concurrent model where there's students online and in person, or you know, moving from an online class for one time the day and then moving into an in-person class. How do you do it, Mark? Because that is something that I know a lot of us are going through, whether we've been doing it all year or just transitioning to a different type of setting. Uh, well, uh, just pick, piggyback off what Chrissy said, you have to have energy. Um, when I begin my class, I play some type of song. I have YouTube going, playing that on my Google slide. Um, and I start class with an uh, entrance ticket. Um, so Google Forms is great with that because it uh, collaborates with uh, Google Classroom. Uh, if you use Schoology, it's got a great ass assessment tool. But I also, I use it at the beginning of class because we all know that like period in between one virtual class to the other and having to go from one class to the other, you only have like five minutes. So like, what can I do? So I'm trying to take attendance and do everything at once. So 
Uh, I, for the first five minutes, I have a song playing, the students take their entrance ticket. Um, but one thing that I do um, in my class is, like when I first start with this virtual thing, I had to figure out how to do project-based learning. Um, that's my thing. And uh, kind of struggle because how do you have students working together, working on projects? Um, and so what I do is I first, you know, use those tools that you know, use the Google Slides. The students can write comments to each other. They can actually write in their Google Docs, write notes to each other so they can split up work. Uh, use those breakout rooms. Uh, what I do is whenever I'm on Zoom, I make 30 breakout rooms. And then every student gets a breakout room and then whoever they're working with, they just say, hey, let me join with this person. Um, and then it allows me to get that one-on-one -on -one time when those students are working on their project during class. Another like false thing that people think about is when you're teaching virtually, you have to teach all 60 minutes online. No, give the students a break, give them time to work on their project so they don't have to listen to you. It's just good teaching, just like in the classroom. We don't speak more than 15 minutes. You gotta give those students the break. So I use those breakout rooms so students can work on the projects together and I can look at their project. They can share their projects with me um, and go from room to room and have that one-on-one -on -one time. Um, now, I know it's been mentioned before, but I use Flipgrid, um, you know, so students can actually present the work. We've, we've, in this virtual setting, we've done too much of this, all right, type something up, up and turn it in, make a Google slide. Well, what uh, the last project, project that I just did is I had the students make a slideshow, but they had to narrate it. And if they didn't know the technology, if they didn't have an Apple uh, computer, I had them narrate it with Flipgrid. And you can always have Flipgrid where the students, you know how they're shy to be on camera. Well, they can just uh, record themselves with uh, audio. Um, lastly, one thing I wanted to share was Google Forms. We've all used it. But what I've used it for the past few years is to track IEP accommodations. Um, one of those things what I do is every day I put I you know I type a Google form a survey for myself and I put my students IEP accommodations and at the end of each day I log in which uh, accommodation that I used and then I submit it to myself and then at the end of the month I turn into my special ed teacher all the accommodations I did for the students and it works for 504s. So that's just using the few tools that I use that I'm an expert at and use, use them um, to my advantage and use them to the extent in, um, that I can. No, that's huge, Mark. That's such a great uh, idea for using that Google Forms to knock out those IEP accommodations just for you as an instructor to know that you are meeting the needs of your students in that class. That'd be amazing uh, to integrate whether you're by yourself as a teacher or you're in that co-teaching type scenario. And I really, really feel like that's an awesome strategy. So what I wanna do now is I want us to spend about a minute for each of the panelists to give their like top two or three like top tips to enhancing uh, their instructional strategies with ed tech. And then what we'll do is we'll have possibly the last about five minutes associated with any sort of question and answer from the audience. Uh, if you wanna start writing your questions in the chat, we will address at least about two or three of them. So I wanna start off with um, just the last remarks. So let's have uh, Kristen, you'll go first, Mark, you'll go second, Jennifer, you'll go, Shannon will go, and then I will go. And then we will then focus on some Q&A and we look forward to hearing your questions. So let's go ahead, uh, Kristen, last uh, remarks, um, two to three go-to strategies for teachers to implement tomorrow. Okay, so the message that I've given my students this year is do the best you can when you can. No one, in, I mean, the last time we went through this was almost 100 years ago where teachers were teaching over the radio and the local newspapers, you know, published the schedule. This is the wild, wild west as far as I'm concerned. And I know that this can get overwhelming. And I see in the chat, you know, a lot of people are overwhelmed. I share all of my stuff with any teacher who asks for it. And sometimes teachers who don't ask for it. I'm sure my department is sick of getting my emails that's like, hey, I made these slides, like use them if you want, don't if you don't. Um, do not hesitate to ask for help. Um, I know that we're supposed to be talking strategies, but honestly, that's the best teacher strategy I can give any new teacher or any experienced teacher. This is year 14 for me. Um, 
And sometimes it feels like year one because it's brand new. Ask other teachers, look at, um, you know, the resources, this will all be available afterwards. Um, I'm sure a, a link will be sent out, but I know it'll be on the paper blog. Um, I do want to give a shout out to paper. If your district does not use it, it's phenomenal. And this is the first year my district has used it. And I am, I am hoping to keep it next year. Um, but ask for help, reach out for help. I have so many teachers that will email me and say, I'm so sorry to bother you again, but man, I love things like that because I'm like, yes, I, you know, I created all this stuff. I would love it if it got used with more students. So I think that some of the takeaways from today is, you know, don't get overwhelmed. I am really good at tech and I still, I tell myself one um, tech tool a week. If I get overwhelmed, I'm like, nope, I'm not going to look at anything new this week. I'm going to keep on chugging with my own thing. Teachers pay teachers. There is a no shame in that game. Teachers pay teachers. Um, uh, teacher TikTok. And then Shannon, I can't remember the name because I have four kids and I don't sleep enough. What was the Pinterest one for educators? Wakelet. Yeah, Wakelet, that one. I mean, use those. And if you get overwhelmed, stop using them and then come up with your lesson plan for the next day. Um, backwards planning, don't find a new tech tool and be like, I must use this. If you have something where you're like, I need to ask students a question for them to respond immediately, honestly, Google that. Ways for students to answer immediately. Um, I use, um, oh, I wish my brain worked better right now. Um, Socrative is a good one, um, or Pollster, or you know, Zoom has a, a polling one. But honestly, I have sat and Googled things before, like, how can I have students? And then it pops up. I'm like, cool, I never knew about this. So um, reach out for help if you need it. Absolutely, 100%. So I hope you guys got some helpful things um, from this. I had fun talking about it. Okay, so I'm out. <laughs> Who's next? Go ahead, Mark. All right, uh, so once again, shout out to Wakelet. Um, Wakelet, I use it for project-based learning um, because your students are at home, so you don't know what resources they're looking at. Um, so I constantly use Wakelet whenever I introduce a new project, so they have a wide variety of resources. And don't be afraid to use videos and YouTube videos as resources, okay? So some students, they learn better visually and audio, you know, using their ears and eyes rather than reading. Um, but my biggest piece of advice would be teach with empathy when it comes to the um, teaching virtually. And I can't uh, say that enough. Uh, just imagine all those, uh, those staff meetings that you're in, okay? Um, imagine, you know, they might not be the most entertaining and with your, you know, you'll have your cell phone next to you and you're going to want to ch check the cell phone. You might want to check, you know, what's on sale on Amazon. Um, so my best advice is Think about how you know you are in your staff meeting, how you would want to change those staff meetings, and then be that teacher. You know, give your students some breaks, make things exciting, have lots of visuals. Okay, play some games now and then. So that's my be best piece of advice when it comes to teaching virtually. Give breaks, just you know, be the exciting teacher you would be in your classroom. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, well, I actually just I put my thoughts in the chat. I mean, just, you know, voice of experience, we're all living in an imperfect world, and we're all essentially imperfect. But I would, you know, the best advice I would give is, be creative, be resourceful, think outside the box. Um, if you're excited about it, they will be too, because that enthusiasm is definitely infectious, and it's contagious. Um, you know, be compassionate, be empathetic, and just lead with love, you know, it's really, it's all about what's good for kids. And um, I know myself that whenever I sit down to come up with a lesson, when I get excited about something, when I'm energized by it, I go in the next day, it doesn't even matter that I'm over a camera. All, their cam all of their cameras come on, they're engaged with me, they're with me. I mean, I watch my, attendan my attendance go up throughout the year. Um, I've watched the cameras go on throughout the year. I've watched some of the most amazing things happen with my students throughout the year, even though we're not face-to-face, -face, I've even made amazing connections with parents over the computer throughout the year. And, and really that's what it's about. And I think, you know, when you're real with kids, when you're real with families, when you um, engage with them, when you connect with them, 
That's really what it's all about. Everything else takes care of itself. A wise person once told me that, you know, it's easy to teach content, especially at the middle school level, but, you know, real champions are the ones who can make those important connections. If you give it some time and you find your way in, really, there's nothing that you can't do. And you, you, you do it together, which is the best part. That's a great word. Uh, I'll go ahead and take over next. And I think if I could give any advice, uh, I did pop something in the chat earlier about giving your students, when you choose to use a new platform or product in your classroom, give your students an opportunity to play with it in a non-academic, low-risk way first uh, so that they can feel comfortable. Because if you're asking them to do a higher uh, order or higher level order thinking activity and you give them a new platform on top of that, you're just gonna go ahead and discourage them right then and there. So let them play with the tool in a non-academic way and then you can start to kind of transition to those academic uh, pieces. The other piece I would say is uh, curriculum. Yes, we've had to uh, you know, cut a lot of it this year. That's the reality. And everybody feels like they don't have enough time. But uh, in that, I think it's important that all educators include uh, social emotional check-ins pretty regularly. And in fact, every single class. Because if you're not doing that, you're not truly caring for the whole student, right? You're just caring for the for the academic side of things. Um, and you know, through those SEL check-ins, you're teaching them resilience. You're asking them to be metacognitive and reflective. And I think that obviously tech tools can come alongside that. I mean, we've we've heard about it here, you know. We have that the Bitmoji classroom. Have your students make their own Bitmoji, right? Have them make their own Bitmoji classroom or you know, have those check-ins on Jamboard or Whiteboard chat. Um, using the pool feature, that's really, really easy. And then the last thing I'll say, and this one's short, and then I'll pass it off to Matt, uh, give yourself, I know, I know educators are sick of hearing this, but give yourself some grace, right? Allow yourself to breathe and understand that like this isn't typical and moving forward, you know, it's not gonna be typical. It's gonna take a while before we get the hang of things, but isn't it a beautiful thing, right? We're learning so much, we're evolving so much and it's time for education to shift. And fortunately we have the tech tools to support that. Wow, so many just great uh, just responses to end, just some great strategies, just some themes. Uh, my themes for everyone is to think less is more. Uh, remember, you're the teacher, you're driving the instruction. You know what good teaching looks like, whether that's using a good research-based strategy or building that community, focusing on the whole child, be that leader that you are in the classroom and reach out. Go on Edu Twitter, go on Awakelet, look up a hashtag, uh, go on YouTube. There's so many resources available that you have a lot of the keys to the toolkit, um, just spending that time to do so. And also just take risks, take risks, take instructional risks because we're all learning. And if you allow, for example, what Shannon said, allowing your students to dabble and play with something and give that real world experience with something, then that's gonna go a long ways when it comes down to it at the end of the day. Overall, I just wanna say thank you so much to Paper for hosting uh, this panel tonight. There's gonna be two other panels uh, relating to topics discussed. There's gonna be a blog post thereafter. And remember, uh, these all these topics, many of these uh, panelists are highlighted in my book that's coming out soon really talks about integrating a lot of this into your practice as well as navigate just not only now in the present, but also the future of education. Uh, I'm Dr. Matt, and we're gonna go in to answer questions maybe for a couple minutes, if anyone has any in the chat. And if anyone does, we will uh, probably take two. Um, if anyone has anything from um, the attendees, just you know, pop it in and one of our panelists will answer that question. If not, we'll log off in the next couple minutes, but uh, thank you everyone for being here. I hope it was really informative. Yeah, thank you, Matt, uh, you know, Shannon, Jennifer, Kristen, uh, Mark, it was such a such a pleasure to to host you and have you share such incredible insights and such a lively discussion for the audience. Um, you know, thank you for making the chat so lively. I think that so many great conversations and adding to the list of tools and tactics alongside the panelists. 
Um, we will do a recap of the discussion and follow up uh, with, via email um, with the recording as well as the recap. So, you know, you, we won't lose all of these incredible insights and tools. Um, if you are interested, as Matt said, I'm putting it in the chat. Our next panel is uh, next Thursday, um, March 11th at 4 p.m. Pacific, um, all around modern strategies for the toggle term. Uh, you can register and join us and um, hope everybody has an incredible evening. And again, thank you so much for such an insightful discussion. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.